Right, well, thank you very much, Sergey, and um, hello, everybody. I'm afraid I can't see you, but uh, if, if there are some friends or people I've met in the past, then uh, it's very nice to, to be in contact with you. Um, actually, I'm starting remembering five years ago. It was, I think, almost exactly to within a few days that I visited Yekaterinburg, and we, we had a small UK-Russian um, workshop with my, my colleague Eugene Gregorians, who you can see in the picture there, and we, we enjoy traveling around the area. So uh, I have very, very good memories, and I, I hope when times are better in the future, we may be able to visit each other again. Um, as Sergei has said, I work in this Center for Science at Extreme Conditions. We do do a lot of high pressure material synthesis mainly, but for today's uh, talk, I'm going to have more of a physics orientation and I'll talk about um, this project that we've had studying what we call orbital molecules. This is a sort of particular area of orbital physics. Um, also, as Sergei said, it follows very much from our work on magnetite. So as a, a brief introduction, I'm just going to sort of introduce this to, to anybody that's not familiar with the, uh, the problem. Um, so magnetite is this famous original magnetic material. It, it occurs naturally. It has a spinel type crystal structure. Um, and it was found a long time ago, re really in the 1920s, that, it, that it's um, unusual because it has what's called an inverse charge distribution. So the charge distribution looks like this. We have um, formerly an iron three plus on the, the what are called te the tetrahedral coordination sites, these blue ones. But the interesting part for the physics is that we have a mixture of exactly one iron two plus and one iron three plus on the average distributed over these brown sites, these octahedral sites. And so that was immediately a question of how the electrons are behaving here. We have effectively one extra electron per two iron atoms. Um, and in a very famous, famous experiment, a Dutch scientist called Verwe cooled magnetite down to low temperatures. This is actually some of his original data from this famous paper in, in 1939, where he found for a good magnetite sample, there's this very sharp uh, change of resistivity and also many other physical properties. Um, and he concluded that this should be a charge localization transition, so that as we cool down, we go from some kind of disordered or, 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 or conducting um, dynamic charge state to a localized state where we have electrons are, are, are localized on particular ion atoms. And this was, I think it's important to, to modern physics because this is really the first example of what we now call charge ordering, or at least it, it was a hypothesis of, of, of charge ordering. Um, there's also something I'll come back to later on that, that immediately in this paper, it shows the importance of sample quality. So the, the data number two on this graph, this is for a sample that was a little off stoichiometric. And you see the transition is, is much less pronounced here. And I'll, I'll mention this later on. But anyway, concerning the, 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 the clean, the pure material, um, Despite this simple prediction of Verwey in 1939, it was really very difficult to, um, to, to prove whether this was true or not. Um, Verwey followed up a few years later with a, a simple proposal for how the charged states might look, as, as, as shown in this picture here. But the diffraction experiments that people could do in, even in the 1940s and 50s showed that this was not the case. Um, it was identified as an early example of frustration. Again, another very important topic in physics because these, um, the, these octahedral, these brown sites are arranged in clusters of four in a sort of tetrahedral arrangement like this. So you have a classic frustration problem that if you're trying to order two different states, of course, you have a highly degenerate uh, arrangement. Um, this, this, uh, this gave rise to a, fa a famous proposal by, uh, by Anderson in 1956 about the charge ordering. It's essentially, he modeled it as an order-disorder transition. Um, there were other theories as, as band structure calculations started becoming available in the 1970s. There, there were ideas about band instability models. 
Um, the fact that when we localize an electron it, as, as chemically, what we call an iron two plus, this creates a local distortion. And so this gave, gave rise to polaron descriptions, bipolarons, molecular polarons. A lot of very, very famous people like Mott and Chakravarti had, um, had theories, in, 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 as you can see, in the 70s and 80s. And then even later on, um, going right up into the, the early 2000s, people like Daniel Komsky ha had some alternative theories where in the idea in, instead of localizing the electrons to make two plus and three plus, another alternative would be to have a, a, the electron localized between two iron atoms so that you'd make it effectively a, a weak bond and, and make sort of diamonds like this without any charge ordering. So all of these different theories were really sort of being proposed and being debated over, over many, many decades. Um, the reasons why it was difficult to know experimentally um, was that although we can make single crystals of magnetite, when we cool magnetite down into the spherway state, the, ch the symmetry becomes very, very low. Magnetite is cubic, the, the, the spinel is, is a cubic structure, but the low temperature state is monoclinic. And that gives rise to terrible twinning problems so that, that a single domain crystal above the Verwey transition has many different domain orientations below the transition. This gave rise to a lot of different experiments, again, going back to the 1970s and 80s. Um, in early days, for example, using magnetic alignment was used, trying to squeeze. This is where, where um, pressure in, in the form of uniaxial pressure can be important to try to squeeze crystals into a single domain. Um, what enabled us to, to, to solve the structure, work, working with two very, very good students, Mark Sen and, and, and John Wright, and we, we spent several years doing this, um, was really the development of microcrystal beam lines at synchrotrons, in, in particular at the ESRF in Grenoble, which we used. So being able to go down to very a very small focused beam, which meant that we could look at very, very small crystals. And then we tried the tricks of we used a magnetic field to align the permanent magnet. And ultimately, just a matter of simply looking at many crystal, many microcrystals and, and, and being lucky. There's, there's always that element, of course, in, in experimental science. Um, but anyway, this is this is some data from the crystal where we solved the structure. So we went to a very what was considered to be a very small crystal at the time, about 15 years ago, although much smaller crystals can be used now. But we, we solved the structure from a, a crystal of about 40 micron size. Even at that size, it's not completely detwinned. But actually, we were quite lucky. This crystal had almost 90% of one twin orientation and 11% of the other one. So we, we analyzed it as a, you can see this actually from the, the, the spot. So this is from the majority and the minority twin. But, but we were able to use standard single crystal software to an analyze this as a mixture of two twins. And then we did a lot of, we, we actually had a lot of unique data and we, and we checked our model against randomized models and so on. Um, just for comparison, I, I've shown here, this is what happens if you go to a larger crystal. So our kind of second best microcrystal that we studied, which was about 100 micron, microns large, uh, had four twin orientations. So you can see two and then another two spots above it. Um, we did check that this gave the, the same structure, which it did, but actually a lot of other data are better. You can see the background is much smoother here and here the background is very noisy, but nevertheless, there were systematic errors, small systematic errors we found in this solution. So having a kind of very small crystal, the smallest number of domains and just living with, with kind of background noise was, was our best solution. So anyway, this is, this, this is a sort of the summary of, of, of that, that crystal structure that, that we analyzed um, 12 years ago now. Um, so there are 16 unique sites in the, um, the unit cell of this, this complex monoclinic state at low temperatures. Um, we analyze the local geometry, looking firstly at what we call the radial distribution. Ra radial distribution is just literally the size. So it's how long the iron oxygen distances are. We expect iron two plus to oxygen distances to be a bit longer than iron three plus to oxygen. 
And the second thing is we looked for orbital distortions. Um, iron 2 plus has a, a weak orbital degeneracy, uh, sorry, a, a, an orbital degeneracy, and that, that gives rise to a, a weak yarn teller distortion, which in fact is of a, um, a tetragonal compression as shown in the cartoon here. So in other words, we have two shorter bonds to, to oxygen and four longer ones in, in, in the plane like that. And so on a kind of plot of these, these are the 16 different sites, we found that we could sort of sort them into two groups of eight. So we have eight here that are, are sort of a bit bigger and they have a, a, a relatively large distortion that the, the negative distortion parameter corresponds to the, the shortening here. And then we have another eight that are a bit smaller and, and have more or less zero distortion. They're, they're, they're clustered around zero on this axis. So it was on that basis that we were able to say that, yes, Verway was, was correct in 1939. And we have a, a complex charge ordered structure, so which is shown here. So blue and yellow are the iron two plus and three plus states. Um, it's it's a very complex arrangement. It, it's interesting that it's that it's intrinsically acentric. That that the charge ordering distribution itself breaks an inversion center. So, for example, that this is um, an intrinsically multiferroic state because we have a, a lack of a center of symmetry. The material is is kind of ferromagnetic in or ferrolimagnetic in the background, and then and then we have this. Um, eccentric symmetry driven by the charge ordering. So it's, it's a charge ordered multiferroic material. So that was kind of, if you like, fairly classical physics. But then the part that was unexpected was, again, analyzing the crystal structure further. We found that whenever, wherever we had these, these nominally iron two plus states, localized electrons, and so the electron in, is in a T2G type, um, D orbital with a distribution like this. So it has lobes that, that are pointing between yeah, sure. two sure. neighbors that are, that are usually iron yeah. three plus. And we found that systematically these distances were actually a little bit shorter. That's what's shown on this histogram here. So the, the this is just showing the, the, the kind of iron iron neighboring distances. Um, and, and the ones that are shaded, this, this hat shading are the ones that we would expect to be shortened if they're in this orientation. And you can see that we really do get shortening. There's a, there's a couple that are slightly longer, but almost all of them are shortened. And this showed this, um, the, 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 this idea that the electrons are not perfectly localized. We don't really have a simple chemical iron two plus picture, but instead we have these units that, uh, in fact, it was my student, Mark Sen, who came up with this idea. We call them trimerons. The idea it's a, a three site polaron, hence the on ending, that the electron is slightly delocalized over the three ions as shown by these kind of cartoon, the, these green cigar shapes like that. And so the, the best description for this localized state is, is, is of a trimerons and trimerons share corners because the, uh, the different trimerons can, can access the, the three different T2G orbitals. So you can have up to three trimerons meeting in a, in a corner like, like we have here. So that's the model that we published in, in 2012. Of course, it, it caused a lot of, uh, of interest at the time, uh, but actually in, in the year since then, um, it seems to have been sort of widely accepted by the international community. And, and in fact, as, as you mentioned, uh, John Goodenough, I, I contributed a paper to, this is a special issue of Chemistry of Materials, it was actually published in 2022. So it was John Goodenough's 100 year birthday, but it was also the 10 year anniversary of us publishing this, um, this, this structure. So I, I, I reviewed the literature and, 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 and wrote a review here. Um, some of you will recognize I, 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 um, I, I parodied um, John Goodenough's famous um, book was called Magnetism and the Chemical Bond, which gives a lot of the fundamental ideas of, about super exchange and band theory for particularly useful for chemists, which he published in the 1960s. So I, I, I made a play on his, his title. So I called it Magnetism and the Trimeron Bond. Uh, but anyway, what, what I've just shown below here, these are some important papers from other groups. This is none, none of this is my own work, um, but really showing the trimeron picture has actually been very useful in, in interpreting um, uh, physical properties of, of, of magnetizing the Verwey state. Um, 
so for example with this group the, the, this is using time resolved soft, soft x-ray diffraction uh, the, 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 at, um, at, at a free electron laser source and again they uh, that they found there were essentially two time scales for um, for, for sort of melting the charge ordering in in um, in magnetite, and they interpreted this as a sort of a, a very fast process, which initially melts the trimerons, and then a slower process as electrons uh, percolate through the lattice. Um, other papers using RICS have have uh, looked at magnetic polarons. This is a more recent paper where where even the uh, using terahertz uh, time resolved spectroscopy, even the soft electronic modes of the, of the trimeron order has has been uh, recently studied. So it seems that there's actually a sort of a, a general um, consensus in the physical uh, the physics community that uh, the trimeron ground state model seems to be correct, and at least it explains lots Lots of different uh, physical observations. I, I, I think I'm correct in saying that there really haven't been any um, any results that have seriously contradicted the the, the trimeron model in any way. Um, so anyway, uh, after we, we 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 published this paper, of course, we wanted to try and fit the the trimeron observation for magnetite in, into a larger physical picture you know what what other materials what other ground states are like the trimerons and so we came up with this this this, this term we use of orbital molecules um, I mean, not everybody likes this term, and you know, it doesn't matter if you, if if you don't like it, we can call it something else. But it's it's simply that there isn't really a general sense, a, a general word for this. Usually, people just refer to dimers because usually, what we call orbital molecules are dimers. So, what we we define them to be is 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 where we have some kind of orbital ordering, but also a direct metal-metal orbital interaction. So, so it involves the three ions that, that, that we saw in, in, in magnetite. But what's much more common is having pairwise interactions. So there are famous examples going back, for example, to, to vanadium dioxide, the, the famous metal insulator transition that I'm, I'm sure you'll know about in, in VO2. Um, and around the same time we were doing this work, some more exotic, these, these are all examples from other spinels. So the, these papers, this, this famous iridium sulfide, where, where we get these kind of rings of, of, uh, of iridium, iridium dimers, which are spin singlets. Uh, similar spin singlet titanium titanium diamonds, which which have a helical structure in in this this titanium spinel, um, and even some very big um, orbital molecule clusters. The, the biggest one that was in the literature was was this this uh, spinel, which at low temperatures has this remarkable vanadium seven unit. So we have seven out of eight vanadiums in these kind of double. Um, tetrahedral clusters, and if this is an 18 electron spin singlet, um, and then you have one vanadium three plus kind of left over in the layers between. I'll actually come back to this later in, in, in the talk and, and actually show you that this is actually a little bit different. different. But anyway, th it seems to me there's this whole class of materials where we have orbital ordering and we have direct metal-metal interactions, and this is what we, we, we set out to study. Um, so the kind of questions really following on from the magnetite work is firstly to look at the, the, the orbital ordering in magnetite itself to see if there were any variations on it by looking at doping. Um, also, we wanted to discover were there trimerons in any other iron oxides, and we, we had one, one discovery here. And then also something interesting about high temperature states. What happens if we go above the charge ordering or the orbital ordering transition for an orbital molecule ground state? Uh, you know, what happens to the orbital molecules at, 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 uh, in a high temperature kind of average structure? Um, the first experiment I'll show you was just something we, we were really interested in, perhaps more from a, 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 I, guess, I guess, a philosophical point of view. Um, I mean, magnetite is very interesting, not, not only as an electronic material, but because it's one of the very few electronic materials we study that really occurs in nature. 
So we were curious to know about whether we could actually discover the, 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 the same magnetite ground state or this complex electronic order in a natural sample. So we took a, a magnetite sample from Brazil, as, as you can read here. The, the, this is a, a natural, you know, the, the octahedral shape is natural. The crystals grow in this way and, and they can be up to about a centimeter wide in, in, in this uh, morphology. So of course we crushed one up just to make a very small um, um, microcrystal for the same synchrotron type of experiment. We did chemical analysis, which as you can see, actually, these materials can, can be very, very pure. You know, there's the, 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 almost, almost really very, very little substitution of other elements in, in natural magnetites. And we found, again, this is the same analysis of, of the sites in the crystal structure on the basis of, of the, the size and the, and the yarn teller distortions. Um, and so the red points are the same ones as I showed before for the pure magnetite. But actually, we, we saw really the same, the same thing. The blue points are for the, the natural sample. Now, we know, for, I mean, this is a sample on Earth. And of course, on Earth, it's never cold enough to be below the Verme transition, which, which is about 120 Kelvin. But we know that there's a lot of cold magnetite in space because sometimes asteroids fall to Earth. And these are some examples of, of some meteorites where people have studied the magnetite inside and they, and they found um, Verway transitions around the same temperature. This, this natural sample is, is, a, is 119 Kelvin and there are natural, natural meteorite samples that uh, have the same TV. So um, I think we can, we can really conclude that I think quite definitely that, that there's actually this, this complex charge ordering is genuinely a natural phenomena. You know, that, that there are goodness knows how much amounts of magnetite in, in, in asteroids, in cold planets in the universe, where this, this is a real mineral occurrence. This, 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 this is not only the most complicated electronic order that I, I think has been discovered in, 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 certainly in, in the sense of sort of charge and orbitally ordered uh, materials, but it's also, the, perhaps the only one, or at least a very rare one, that actually occurs naturally. It's, it's, it's a real phenomenon out there in the universe. Now, being a bit more systematic about the doping of magnetite, this is some very beautiful, really, really classic work in the, in the field from George Hernig, who, who grew a lot of doped magnetite crystals in the 1980s and 90s. Um, and he showed that there was a change in the Verwey transition. So these are different dope magnetites, as you can see, doped in different ways. You can, you can do it by slightly oxidizing the material or by having chemical substitutions. And, and the Verwey transitions from these different crystals all fall on, on fairly good straight lines. But as you can see, there's this kind of discontinuity at a certain doping level, um, really a change from a first order um, transition in, in for, for, for lower dopings to a, a more continuous second order transition in the region here and a lower limit of about 80 Kelvin on, on the Verway transition. Um, and we were interested to try to repeat our single crystal experiments to look at a doped uh, crystal to see if there's any difference in the structure. And so this is a comparison of, of crystals for, for, for three low. The, the first one is the original material. The first one is doped, but still in the first order transition. But the really interesting one is the third crystal, a, a zinc doped crystal with about 2% doping, where we're, we're in a, the, the continuous or second order regime. You can see that the, the, the Verway transition becomes much more continuous. Now, what we're seeing in the graph here, this is again all from crystallography. This is all from solving the crystal structure, measuring bond distances very accurately, and then looking at all of these distortion modes in terms of the size and the, and the, the yarn teller distortion and the trimeron formation. And this is what we're measuring in, 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 on the positive axis is essentially the loss of the distortions going from the very pure to the, to the not so pure magnetite. Now you can see it's, very, it's pretty equal across all sites, except that one site, this, this site that has the label B42, you can see there's a much bigger loss of the trimeron bonding, which is the green, and the orbital distortion, which is the blue, and the, and the, the charge localization, which is the yellow. 
Now, the B-42, this is an interesting trimeron. It's what we sometimes call a bad trimeron, because in this trimeron picture, we always have what, uh, what's an iron 2 plus in the middle, and then we have an iron 3 plus at each end. But this special trimeron, for reasons we really don't understand, does not have that. It actually has an iron 2 plus at one end. The, the iron 2 plus is using one of its other T2G orbitals. It is, so, so, so this iron 2 plus has an electron localized in one of the T2G orbitals to, to make its own trimeron like this. But then it also uses a different T2G orbital to act as the end for the trimeron here. So this is, if you like, a kind of a, a more stressed or a more a higher electron electron repulsion with this trimeron. And so very interestingly, we see that the doping selectively removes this trimeron. In other words, we're localized, we're, we're, um, we, we're removing the localized electrons. And it's only a tiny number, remember, it's only 2% of electrons being removed from these uh, from the whole structure, but they are specifically localized at this state here. So this is another very remarkable and I think unique observation about charge order. In general, we can't, charge order is not usually a very robust phenomenon. We can't usually remove one electron from a charge ordered arrangement while still keeping the rest of that arrangement. But here we can. We can selectively remove the electrons from here and all the rest of the trimeron arrangement, everything else that we see is, is still uh, provided. So it's like a, it's a charge order within a charge order. Uh, I mean, we saw in the paper we wrote, we speculated about using this for selective redox reactions or some kind of information storage. That's, that's maybe science fiction. But just as a, another example of how remarkable and unique um, uh, magnetite is, we have this, this observation that uh, it can actually, the charge order can survive even if we selectively um, oxidize one of the sites. Now, a further um, study that gives, I think, some really in interesting insights into why we have this change, why does it go from first to second order as we don't magnetite, has come from a collaborative study. And I, and I want to say immediately that this work was not done by, by my group. This is actually from the group, group of J. Gwen Park, who's in, in Seoul National University in, in, in Korea. And in particular, uh, various is very hardworking postdoc, uh, Taehun Kim, who did all the experimental work. Um, this is a very long, slow experiment. What they, they their colleague, um, who is, um, let me see, Taehun Huan, has a very nice chemistry for making magnetite nanoparticles that are very, very uniform in size. So they, they were able to make magnetite nanoparticles that are four, 44 nanometers diameter. And, and the, that's monodispersed to within an area of plus or minus three. So that the distribution is between 41 and 47 nanometers. So really very, very uniform sizes. And what um, Taehun did was simply observe the very slow oxidation of magnetite. Magnetite naturally oxidizes if you just leave it you know, in, in the air, it, it, the iron two plus is slowly oxidized to iron three plus. And they measured the physical properties of these nanoparticles as it oxidized over many, many days. So you can see the scale here is in days. So they measured it uh, for a long time up to 157 days. So that, that's already, um, you know, ab about uh, five months. And then actually they even did a final observation. I suggested they did a final observation. And this is, this is after 1,000 days. So this is, this is nearly three years after the experiment started. So it's a very long, slow experiment. Um, we, we have a, I don't know what the Russian equivalent would be, but in English we have a joke that if, if something is very slow and boring, we say it's like watching paint dry. You know, you paint a wall and then you just slowly, you watch it slowly drying. But this is even more slow and boring. It's watching magnetite oxidize. But anyway, although it's very 
slow and boring to watch, it gave some fascinating results. So what they found in magnetization and, and also in other physical properties is that the magnetite, the, the, the Verway transition, so it starts off very sharp at, at about 125 Kelvin. And as magnetite slowly oxidizes, the transition moves to lower temperatures and also becomes much broader. And I, this is kind of not surprising. <clears throat> but then later, after you can see here, it actually sharpens up again and it moves to slightly higher temperatures. So this is summarized here. So this is the, the measurement of the Verway transition itself. It goes through a dip and then recovers to a kind of long-term persistent value at about, uh, about uh, 95 Kelvin. So this is this final measurement. Even after three years, it's, it stays in this position here. And you can see measurements from X-ray diffraction, NMR, heat capacity, as well as the magnetization, all agree very nicely. And also the blue scale shows the width of the transition. So you get the maximum width at the minimum here, and then, and then the transition sharpens up a bit. <clears throat> There's a clue that this is all about, this is really a chemistry observation. I mean, it's related to the oxidation, and, and the clue from this comes from a nice scaling. So the data here, this is again the Verway transition, and this is the width of the Verway transition. And if you measure it in, in different oxygen partial pressures, um, you, you, you get a, a relationship where, where you get a scaling with, with the oxygen partial pressure to the, 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 the negative exponent here experimentally is found to be 0.18. Um, the theory that you can just write down a, a simple theory based on the oxidation of magnetite, you predict it should be 0.25. So it's actually in pretty good agreement with that. So what's going on here is that we're seeing two effects. And this was again, beautifully modeled in, in the paper. All, all the details are in the paper. And again, Tae Hun did, did, did all of this. Um, but essentially what we're seeing are two different effects on the Verway transition. We're seeing both a chemical effect. We know that we can change, in general, we can change the, the values of, of transition temperatures by doing chemical doping. But we can also change them by physical and, and, and mechanical processes like strain or pressure. And of course, what happens when we oxidize the magnetite is that we see a mixture of both. So what these pictures down here are showing, this is, this is the concentration gradient, so dc by dr. It's showing the, the, the gradient of, of, of oxygen. We have excess oxygen at the surface that gradually diffuses towards the center. And after a long time, it starts to oxidize the center to, to make a mag he might core. And then we get a more uniform distribution. And effectively, what the modeling all shows is that the, um, the minimum dip at about 80 Kelvin, which, which incidentally corresponds to the minimum that was seen in this study of, of crystals by, by Hernig, really, really corresponds to the maximum um, concentration gradient. In other words, the maximum strain across the sample. And so the, 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 the effective conclusion of all of this is that these two regimes are really showing the difference between homogeneously so homogeneously doped in the in the first order transition and inhomogeneously doped magnetite in, in the second one. It's actually very difficult. It takes a long time in these experiments. You, you have to wait effectively, you know, six months or a year to have homogeneously doped magnetite. And so the the long term, the persistent value of about 95 Kelvin more or less corresponds to the, the, the sort of the gap between these, the, these, um, the, the, these two values here. So it's essentially showing that, that as you wait longer and longer, you become less and less inhomogeneous. And so you kind of come back up here, not because of doping, but because of strain, because if this graph is, is effectively also measuring strain, although, although it's, uh, it, it's written in purely chemical terms at the time. But, but um, anyway, I think this is an absolutely fascinating observation. And I think it gives us a, a general sort of warning as well. We have to be very, very careful when, when we talk about doping as the only variable in driving, um, in, in, in driving electronic properties of materials, because although electron or whole concentrations are important, there are also chemical and in particular strain consequences that, that can occur from doping, in particular, if it's not done in a homogeneous fashion. 
So I'm, I'm moving on now to the, the question of can we observe um, trimerons in other iron oxides? And, and we found a, a, a very nice example that does show this. So that this is um, a material calcium iron three oxygen five. This is part of a family of materials that have been of, of very big interest in the last 10 years. Um, magnetite was the only known mixed valence iron oxide for really kind of hundreds of years and, until about 19, uh, until about 2011, when high pressure research by geophysicists found that many new iron oxides could be made at high pressure, in particularly in the, the, the most, fa most famous, most easy access one, if, if you put iron for this formula, so you can make Fe405, which is a new example of a, a mixed valence iron oxide, and itself has very interesting low temperature charge and orbital, and, e and even some kind of trimeron, dimeron ordering has been proposed there. That, that Again, that's work from other people. But this same family of materials can be made with other cations. And, and uh, you can, in fact, make it, uh, you, you can either put different transition metals here using pressure, but you can also put non-magnetic calcium here. And, and the calcium material is one that you can make at ambient pressure. So we, we studied this, and the material has a, a ferri magnetic transition very close to room temperature, as, as you can see here. But what's fascinating is when we cool the material down um, using uh, neutron diffraction data, so we're, where we can see magnetic as, as well as structural changes to the lattice, we observed simultaneously magnetic peaks coming from two different magnetic phases. They have incompatible propagation vectors. One of them is zero, zero, zero. The other one is half zero, zero. Um, and it turns out that what we're seeing in this material is an example of an electronic and magnetic phase separation. We, the, the, the two phases, although they retain the same lattice symmetry, you know, the, the high temperature and the two low temperature phases all have the same orthorhombic CMCM symmetry. Their structures are different enough that with these high resolution data, we can actually analyze all the different structures. So we're fitting two independent crystal structures and their associated magnetic structures in, in, the, in the fits that are shown here. And the pictures that emerge are as follows, that one of the two phases is charge ordered. So we call it the CO, the charge ordered phase. And in fact, it's not only charge ordered, but it's also orbitally ordered. Again, we can do the same kind of analysis that we did with the magnetite and show that we have the local yarn teller distortions in the central site. We have in the crystal structure, we have kind of natural groups of three ions in exactly the same geometry as in the trimerons. These chains don't continue any further. That's just the, the way the structure is put together. And in this charge ordered phase, we observe exactly the same things as we had in magnetite. So we have iron two plus in the middle, we have iron three plus at the two ends, the spins are all parallel to each other, that allows the additional electron from the iron two plus to be delocalized, we see a shortening of the iron iron distances here or here, so we, we have a kind of second very nice observation of trimerons. And what's rather nice in a way is that the other phase, we have, we have a, a second electronic phase that's present simultaneously. We call that the CA, the charge averaged phase, because this, in this case, there is no charge ordering. The, 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 all the ion states have the same um, uh, average oxidation state. Um, and the moments go anti-parallel, across these groups of three go anti-parallel. So you can see it goes to the, to the left, then the right, then the left. So there's no possibility for this kind of magnetically um, induced delocalization of the electron here. And indeed, we can measure this experimentally. We, we, we see the shortening of the iron ion distances like this. We see it in the charge ordered phase. We don't see it in the charged average phase. We see the arm teller distortions in this phase at this, this site. We don't see it there. So it's really a, a kind of remarkable occasion where you can see two different crystal structures of, of the same material. And one is charge orbital or trimeron ordered, and the other one has no charge order, no orbital order, no trimeron formation. Um, the reason why we have the two 
structures present. It turns out that this material is really, so it's rather like the manganite materials. It's very delicately balanced between these two different electronic ground states. Uh, another group um, for, for, from Oxford, in fact, published a follow-up paper where they showed that if the material is very, very pure, you only get the charge ordered phase. Our material, in fact, was accidentally slightly doped. We had a little bit of disorder, a little bit of substitution of calcium for iron. So we had a kind of lucky accident that doped it into the region where we actually got this mixture of the two different phases. And then we, we did some follow-up studies which showed if, if you deliberately dope it with larger amounts, if you once you go above 10%, you see only this charge averaged phase. So you go from this one when it's undoped, you get a mixture of these two up to about 10% doping, and then and then this one was pure. So it was very, very lucky, but nevertheless, it's it's a very um, unusual case and a non-manganite example of electronic phase separation. And it's also very nice from the point of view of the trimerons because um, one phase is trimeron ordered and the other one isn't. Um, so I'm going to, for, for the last part of the talk, I'm going to um, go to a different aspect of, of, of these orbital molecules. We've seen that we have them well ordered in, in different um, in different ground states, but then what happens to high temperature states? Uh, and I'm going to start by looking at, at some some of our own data for this material. We we were sort of naturally interested in our aluminium V two O four because this was the largest example of of, of orbital molecules or orbital clusters in, in, in that, that was reported in the literature. So we were interested to see what happened to this at high temperatures. So to do this, we used um, a very popular diffraction technique now, which, which is called PDF. You, 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 are, you use total scattering. So you analyze both the diffraction data, but also the diffuse background data. You eff effectively Fourier transform that to obtain what's called the pair distribution function, which are, which are these graphs shown here. So the pair distribution function is really just a histogram of, um, of 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 atoms according to their 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 pairwise separation, um, and of course this is a very very good technique for looking at orbital molecules because orbital molecules are very much based on shortening of metal metal distances between neighbours, and so this can be seen rather well, especially when the the metals are, for, are involved are the heaviest metals, and that's true here. So, so the aluminium V204, vanadium, of course, has more electron density than um, aluminium or oxygen. So the pair distribution function is very sensitive to the vanadium-vanadium distances. Um, so we analyzed the aluminium compound, and in fact, we also we made a new material. We, we, we made a gallium analog of this, which has the same low temperature structure. The, the, the aluminium one has a charge ordering temperature very high, 700 Kelvin. So we have a, a distorted structure with these clusters below 700 Kelvin. And the same thing occurs but below 450 Kelvin for, for gallium. So as a kind of check on the method, we looked at the pair distribution function for the aluminium material at room temperature. So this should be in the, in the disordered state. Um, and this shows the fit. So, so the red line here shows the fit of the crystal structure model with these, with these seven atom clusters to the experimental data in the pair distribution function. And you can see that the fit is, is really pretty good everywhere except in this region here, shown in gray, and this is just expanded down at the bottom. But this region, around three angstroms, three angstroms is the distance for one vanadium to nearest vanadium distance. So it's telling us that the crystal structure is effectively right, but there's something about the local structure and these orbital molecules that is not correct. You can see it really doesn't fit the data well in this region. So we tried some alternative models and we found that we could make one very simple change to the structure that, that changed the agreement and gave now this very nice agreement you see down in the bottom or, or in this one here. And all we did was to take the central vanadium and move it slightly. So instead of being in the center of the two sets of three, it moves 
towards one of the two triangles. So in other words, what this experiment tells us, the kind of the difference between this and this, is that we don't actually have this, we don't truly have these vanadium-7 orbital molecules. What we have is a pair. We have, we have a vanadium-3 orbital molecule, and we have a vanadium-4 orbital molecule like this. Um, and you can assign them the formal charge states like this. So both of them are, are spin zero uh, objects. They're, they're, they're both completely spin paired, um, as was theoretically this, this vanadium seven here. So, so, so these are both diamagnetic species. So in other words, what we have in the crystal structure is actually we, we always have pairs like this, but they're disordered. In other words, sometimes we have the four atom cluster at the bottom and three at the top. But if you imagine inverting that, so, so sometimes we have four at the top and three at the bottom. So, so statistically, this um, vanadium is disordered. It would be, many people have said this to me, and it would be beautiful if you could order these, you would make a polar state, you, you would have a ferroelectric state, based on orbital molecule ordering, because you'd get dipoles that were all the same way. But unfortunately, there's no experimental evidence for that. Or, or we, we tried both models, but all of our models for, to modeling the data show that we just get disordered pairs of these. So kind of up, down or down, up randomly in the crystal structure. So then we also collected data at high temperatures. So this is analyzing data at 1100 Kelvin. So now we're in a cubic spinel structure where we, in the average picture, we, we don't see any orbital molecules. But again, we're looking locally at the structure with the PDF method. And what we see is, is, if you like, it's a similar story. The structure fits well to the cubic spinel model, but not in this region of vanadium vanadium distances. So there's clearly discrepancy there. And so that again showed us that actually the average spinel structure is not locally correct for this material. Um, and what we ended up doing was we used a model effectively based on the low temperature structure with these vanadium-3 and these vanadium-4 orbital molecules. But now they're just completely disordered in the lattice. They're not present in, in pairs like they were in the low temperature state. And again, once you, you put that model in, you, you, you recover good, uh, good agreement with the data. So in other words, what it tells us that these orbital molecules are still present even in the cubic phase, even at a very high temperature, 1100 Kelvin, these vanadium vanadium orbital interactions are really very, very strong. They're, they're effectively chemical bonds. And so we never really achieve the uniform cubic high temperature state. We always just have a disordered state like that. And, and I think that's really quite important for the way that we view the physics of materials like this, that the, if we look at the average crystal structure, it's very easy to, to go to some kind of K space instability picture or, or piles instability, something like that, where we go from a uniform high temperature structure to a distorted low temperature structure. But the reality I think is very different. What we're really looking at is an orbital molecule order to disorder transition. We're going from a, a high temperature state where they're just randomly disordered to a low temperature structure where we have a partial order in these kind of up, down or down, up pairs. Um, we followed up, we, we were interested to look at the dynamics of these orbital molecules. So, so we did quasi-elastic neutron uh, scattering at ILL, uh, but actually we couldn't find any change in the dynamics up to 1100 Kelvin. So it tells us that even at 1100 Kelvin, these clusters are actually really effectively localized, or at least they, have, they, they must have very slow dynamics uh, below the, the time scale for the, for the Quenz experiment. Um, and again, this is just looking at average, the, the difference between average structure, where we would just have a single vanadium, vanadium distance, but these are the local distances. And you can see we really have quite a big difference between large and small distances because of this local formation, again, right up to the highest temperature we could, we could measure, 1100 Kelvin. Um, and we just followed that up, um, Alex Brown, my PhD student, we looked also at the doping 
um, we, we actually did it for the gallium system, so 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 that we can we can make solid solutions all the way from gallium to pure zinc. Uh, zinc V two O four is quite well studied studied in the literature. It has some orbital ordering, although it's been discussed. It's a little bit controversial, but but it, a thorough orbital order model seems to have been proposed. Um, and so this time we're looking at how doping affects these distances and, and hence the presence of orbital molecules. And what we found is that orbital molecules are present almost all the way across the, across the phase diagram, but not at the end near zinc. Um, this graph is a kind of average displacement. Effectively, you, you could this looks like an order parameter for the formation of, of disordered local orbital molecules. And you can see it continues all the way, but it just comes down to zero at about sort of 87 or 90 percent doping. It's really, again, it's not temperature dependent. The, these points are for two different temperatures, and you can see that they really follow the same. So that we have what we might think of as classical orbital physics, by which I mean single atom orbital physics. So we have well-behaved you know, vanadium three plus, vanadium two plus, just in this region here. But in all the rest of the series, really the physics has to be described in terms of orbital molecules. We, we, we're forming these, these vanadium three, vanadium four units, and, and those are really the, the kind of key ingredient for the, for, for the physics there. Um, and, and if you're saying, well, why does it change? We, we, we found actually it's mainly a distance um, criterion. Um, if you compare the, uh, the, the, the vanadium vanadium distance uh, to compared to an ideal one, um, where the distances tend to be relatively short, such as the aluminium or, or uh, vanadium ones or these mixed ones with, with orbital molecules, they're relatively short. The famous vanadates that are studied uh, very much in the literature, lithium vanadate or the zinc or magnesium vanadate, these are actually in a kind of slightly different category. They have relatively long vanadium, vanadium oxygen distances, and that prevents the formation of orbital molecule ground states. And we get some interesting orbital physics here, but we should be aware that we're in a kind of special situation that elsewhere, the physics is very much dominated by the uh, the, the formation of, of ordered or disordered um, orbital molecules. So finally, the very last thing to show is coming back to magnetite again. Naturally, we're interested in what happens to the trimerons at high temperatures in, in magnetite when we go along the Verwey transition. Now, again, many people over the, the many, many years of, of studying the magnetite have, have, have considered this. And it's been, been known for a long time, since early studies of, of diffuse scattering in the 1970s, that, that there's really very well-structured diffuse scattering. Um, this is some beautiful data from a, a group at ESRF. As you can see, they, they, they published that um, ju just about 10 years ago. Um, and this is just a, this is just a representation of data. So this is showing all the diffuse scattering that you get from a magnetite crystal slightly. It's just very slightly a, a fraction of a, of a degree above the Verwey transition. So you're very close to the ordering transition. So it tells us that we really have very well um, structured local structural correlations in magnetite above the Verwey transition, even though the average crystal structure is just a cubic spinel. So we did a similar study as, as, as with the vanadium materials. Um, we, 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 we took a powder diffraction study. Uh, we collected data over a very wide range of temperatures, all the way from, uh, from 90 Kelvin, so below the Verwey transition, right up to 923. And that's significant because it's above the Curie transition for magnetite, which you'll, you'll see in a minute. Um, what we did, the results I'll show you on the next slide, we effectively fitted an average parameter. We call this thing the, the Verwey shift parameter, this, this, this F parameter, which is really a one parameter description of all the complicated 
charge and orbital and trimeron displacements that we observe in the low temperature structure. The low temperature structure is very, very complex. We couldn't begin to fit all of that, all of those different aspects of the structure um, to, to, to the PDF data. So we've assumed that all of those things move together. They all, they all change from kind of zero to one. So zero means no Verway distortion and one means that 100% of the, the, the Verway distortion as measured at 90 Kelvin. And we've measured how much of this Verway distortion we have at different distances. So we call this first, second, and third unit cell. Essentially, the first unit cell is very short range interactions. The second is kind of medium range. The third is long range. They, they correspond to the, to, to the distance regions that are shown on the, the graph here. But anyway, this is the, the key result. If we look at the long range, so the third, what's called the third unit cell correlations, Verway correlations, these are the green points. They have a value of about one as they should. So this is the, the long range ordered Verway structure, all this complex order. And as we go through the Verway transition, it kind of collapses to, to zero. So that's really the same information as from the average crystal structure. If we look at the near neighbors, second unit cell, like the blue points, we see some diffuse, some, some short range correlations, very classical behavior for, for all materials. We always see some short range correlations above a transition temperature. And then well, below here, we, we can't fit it anymore, but it effectively goes to zero somewhere here. So again, quite classical. But the very interesting one are the local really local, meaning first unit cell. First unit cell is really on the length scale of about one trimeron. This, this, this distance is about six, six angstroms. The, the local structural correlations, they fall as we warm up through the Verway transition, but not very much. They fall only to about 80% of the value below the Verway transition. So in other words, locally, even though we're in the cubic phase, we still have you know, about 80% of the distortions related with charge and orbital and trimeron formation. And then as we follow that to higher temperatures, you can see that they then start to fall and they fall very nicely and they finally go to zero, very close to the magnetic Curie transition. The, the, the black data here, these are the magnetization data. And so you can see the magnetization follow these local structural correlations very, very beautifully. So what this tells us really, this is showing us the origin of the Verway transition. In other words, as soon as we get a ferromagnetic ordering, and the ferromagnetic ordering is, is or it's ferromagnetic ordering of the, the B sites, so the, the, the other tetrahedral sites are opposite. But as soon as we get the ferromagnetic ordering, which is represented by the, the three big arrows, remember we have five unpaired D electrons on each ion. As soon as this happens, if you imagine cooling down, that immediately creates a possibility for this additional electron to be well localized, but also a little bit delocalized to make these trimerons. And so we immediately start to see the shortening of the iron ion distances, which are really what dominate the, uh, the, the, the PDF here. So that we're making these, tri these trimerons come into existence at the Verway transition. So they're there locally, they're really very well defined in a local sense, right down to, you know, below, at, certainly at room temperature, below room temperature. And, and the Verway transition is really just the long range ordering. It's, it's the disorder to order transition of the, the trimerons. Um, those of you that know the field of frustrated magnetism, can we can see a kind of obvious analogy here with frustrated magnets. We can see, we consider the, the the electronic ordering in in magnetite to be a frustrated electronic order. We can take the ratio of the um, the Curie temperature, which is really the temperature scale for formation of the trimerons, to the Verway transition temperature, which is the temperature scale for their ordering, and that, that ratio is about seven, which is kind of typical for frustrated magnets, or, you know, or highly frustrated magnets, where we take the ratio of the, the Weiss temperature to the, the Nael temperature. So, and again, I think the important physics picture is that certainly in the past literature, 
on magnetite, the Curie transition and the Verwey transition were considered to be very much decoupled because they had very different temperature scales. But we now know that they're actually very, very closely connected through this observation here, that, the, that really the, the Curie and the Verwey transitions are all connected to, to trimerons. So this brings me to the, the end of my talk and my, my, my conclusions. Um, I hope I've managed to convince you that, that orbital molecules are, are real, if you like. They're real space quantum objects with pairing often just of two electrons to, to, to give a, a sort of spin a half diameter, but, but we can get bigger examples as well. And they're actually very robust. They usually spin zero entities, but the, the trimerons are an exception because they're, they're, they're sort of effective spin a half particles. Um, we saw in this calcium iron oxide that, that the uh, coupling to the lattice can drive mesoscopic physics, the long range phase separation in, in this material. Um, and also the, the last part of the talk, showing that these orbital molecules really can persist to very high temperatures, even though the average crystal st structure does not show them. So we've, we've seen these trimer and tetramer units going to really very, very high temperatures in the vanadium oxides. The trimerons persist right up to the Curie transition in, 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 in magnetite. Um, many of these electronic transitions are really order disorder transitions of the orbital molecules and, and they're not related to, to, to electronic instabilities in, in, in the band structure. And if you're asking, well, how can we tell the difference between the two? I, I think it's the electronic properties are really important. Um, usually if we do a band structure calculation for a regular spinel for these materials, we would predict that they would be metallic, but often we'll find that they're insulating with some kind of small charge gap. And I think it's really the form of the disorder created locally by the orbital molecules that actually opens a small gap. So it, may, it, may, it makes materials that we would expect to be metallic are actually insulating. And I think in particular, finally, I, I, the, the final point to leave you with is, is, is that um, we, we, we would argue that it's the formation of the trimerons at the Curie transition is, is effectively the order, uh, but the frustrated order of uh, frustrated origin of the Verwey transition in magnetite. So I will finish there. I'll just thank different members of my research group. I'll thank funding agencies and in particular the ERC. They, they gave me a a research grant to, 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 to follow up on this, this orbital molecules uh, research, which is, which is really what I've shown you today. So I will finish there and uh, thank you, and I'm happy to, to, to answer any questions.